In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. And welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us. Our Chaplain's Report today, it's going to be a continuation of the series that we've been doing in 1 Samuel. And you may recall, if you were watching the Chaplain's Report from yesterday, that what the, the episode that we're sort of watching unfold in Israel right now is that Israel is getting ready. They are prepared for battle. They have gathered together. King Saul has all of his troops ready to go. They're about to go and face the Philistines. And all of a sudden, without anybody noticing, his son, Jonathan, the prince of Israel, and his armor bearer just kind of sneak off on their own. And Jonathan, with a great show of courage and faith that we talked a lot about yesterday, decides that he is going to go up and walk literally straight into the enemy camp and see if God will allow him to negotiate his way into a settlement or something like that. And he says going into it that he already understands that the Lord has delivered them into his hand, and maybe he'll deliver Israel by what's going on now, or he may deliver Israel through just having them win the battle. But either way, Jonathan is able to do this because he has that confidence that God is going to take care of him. And here we see sort of the outcome, the results of that decision that he made. So we'll go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 11 through 13, where he says, When both of them revealed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, the Philistines said, Behold, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. So the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor-bearer, and said, Come up to us, and we will tell you something. And Jonathan said to his armor-bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet, with his armor-bearer behind him. And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor-bearer put some to death after him. So here's a pretty good example of Jonathan and his great faith and courage, and the only way that I know to describe it, the best way to describe it, I would say boldness. His boldness actually winds up paying off. Jonathan goes off on his own, having nothing but his armor bearer at his side, and faith that God is going to protect him as he walks into a camp filled with his enemies. You know, I was actually just recently reading through the book of Psalms, and I hit the 23rd Psalm like two or three days ago, and that line in the 23rd Psalm that, frankly, sometimes I just kind of overlook, not because I think it's insignificant, but because I just focus so much on the rest of that Psalm that David wrote, of course, David being Jonathan's best friend, and you can kind of see the similarities there, is that God prepares a table for me in front of my enemies. And the sentiment that is reflected in David's 23rd Psalm, and I genuinely wonder if maybe that particular part of the psalm was inspired by his best friend's exploits at this particular time, that basically there is no place that is too dangerous for you to go when God is there. Now, I think that God also expects us to be intelligent and wise and smart. I think those are all true things as well. But the point is, if God's on our side, we really don't have anybody on this earth that we have to fear. We don't have to fear other men taking advantage of us. We don't have to fear even something as horrible as physical worldly death because God is going to ultimately be on our side regardless. In fact, in the New Testament, it really harps on this as well, especially, for example, like at the book of James, that we don't even really have to fear municip or municipalities, principalities. <laughs> I almost used the wrong word there. Uh, we don't have to fear municipalities either, but <laughs> principalities, demons, even sort of spiritual enemies, those things are all nothing. They pale in comparison to God's power, and as long as we are doing what He asks us to do, as long as we are following Him and in His favor, then we could have the kind of faith and boldness that Jonathan has to march right into the enemy camp and be confident that we're going to be okay. And you really see that on display in this passage where when they call Jonathan, they hail him and say, okay, come on up into our camp. Jonathan's like, oh, yeah, we've got it. 
Definitely. This is a sign that God has delivered them into our hands. Because you'll remember in the previous passage that we read yesterday, that he said, well, if they tell us to, to go on, then we'll go up to them anyway. But if they call us, and they call us to come into their camp, that's the sign that God has already delivered the Philistines into the hands of Israel. So he's already very confident with this. And I think that the best way to really look at this story and understand it is, let's try to look at the outcome of this story through two different perspectives. Let's first look at it from the world's perspective, because that gives us an accurate perspective of what the world would want Jonathan to think in this situation. Well, the first thing the world would say is, don't do it. The first thing the world would say is, look, not only would it be very foolish for anybody of the enemy camp, in this case, the Philistines' enemies, Israel, to walk into the camp of those who they are about to go to war with, not only is that foolhardy, but that's especially true when you're the son of the king, the man leading the attack. You could very easily be captured and be using as leverage or some kind of bargaining token to give the Philistines a great advantage or, or maybe even cost the lives of Israelites. And yet Jonathan has such confidence in God and that he has already determined ahead of time what the outcome of the battle is going to be. He has already determined ahead of time the time of, of Jonathan's death and that he already has decided that Israel is going to win this fight. Jonathan's like, yeah, let's go ahead. Let's just walk right in there and maybe the Lord will deliver us this way. And what's funny is the result is even better than Jonathan was expecting. Because what Jonathan was expecting, presumably based on the context of this scripture, is that he was going to walk in there and negotiate some kind of deal, that he was going to, you know, figure out some kind of way for them to take advantage of them in the battle. But Jonathan never expected for this to essentially be the killing blow. Jonathan never expected for them to invite him in and be terrified thinking that the Hebrews, the Israelites, are all hiding in the crevices of the crag, the mountains there around him, like Jonathan just came out of. See, they're on this negotiation thing that they're doing right here, thinking that they are currently, their garrison is completely surrounded by Hebrews in hiding, when really the only Hebrews there are Jonathan and his armor bearer. And I absolutely believe that that rumor mill was, if not started by, at least expounded upon or made more of a threat by God's providence. I don't know that for sure. I don't know if God like planted that idea in one Philistine's head and then it just kind of spread like wildfire or how that works. But I find it hard to believe that providence didn't play a role in that in some way. And so here we have a really, really good example of Jonathan just deciding that he's going to do what God wants him to do. And not only does it have results similar to what he already thought. Now, keep in mind, Jonathan was a very faithful person. He's a very optimistic person, at least in regards to this one particular uh, story, that he's very confident that God is going to deliver Israel. I don't think even Jonathan thought that it was going to be this good. Even he didn't expect results that were this beneficial to Israel to where basically Jonathan and his armor bearer by themselves pretty much win the battle. And an entire garrison of Philistines flee in fear. And I think that that also illustrates a truth that is, is just as relevant to us today as it was to Jonathan thousands of years ago. That when you're following the Lord, even if you are a faithful person, even if you believe that God is going to make it all work out, even if you are somebody that diligently seeks after Him, sometimes God gives you a win that is so big even you couldn't imagine how good it was going to be. Now, I'm not a preacher of the prosperity gospel, and I don't think that this story is illustrating, oh, well, as long as you're doing something in the name of God, that you'll be able to accomplish anything that you want. Well, no, that's a little different here, because Jonathan already knew that God had already given the charge to Israel to win this battle, and so it wasn't like Jonathan was just like, I'm going to be the world's greatest basketball player in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through... 
he wasn't misappropriating God's uh, message here. He wasn't treating God as some kind of cosmic gumball machine to where if I do all these things exactly the way God wants me to, he's going to give me what I want. No, Jonathan was doing this because it's what God wanted, and he was already confident that God wanted Israel to be able to triumph and to deliver them from their enemies. And as a result of that, the results of his faithfulness, God res rewards his faithfulness and his courage to an extent that is so great, even Jonathan didn't think that it could be that good. Even Jonathan wasn't expecting to essentially be the sole person that drove the Philistines out, that he didn't even have to negotiate and you know give something up in order for them to reach this deal. They just basically got everything and walked away with it scot-free, despite the fact that it was all based on something a fear that had been stirred up in the Philistine camp that didn't even exist. Thinking that they were surrounded when the truth is the only Hebrew within, you know, earshot, presumably, would have been Jonathan and his armor bearer. And so, when we go forward trying to do what God wants us to do, let's also be aware of the fact and, and really sort of be grateful for and take solace in that our God is a great God that can bring about results that even we didn't see coming, that even we couldn't have imagined. And one other big point that I want to bring up, and, and this speaks to Jonathan's motivation, I want you to notice there at the tail end of verse 12, where um, he says that the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. That shows a great deal of humility. Jonathan didn't say, well, God has delivered my enemies into my hands. Would that have been accurate? Yes. Would Jonathan have been sinning in saying that? I don't think so. I mean, David says that often. We see other kings of Israel saying, God has delivered the enemies into my hands. That's not an incorrect thing. But it shows a great deal of humility that Prince Jonathan, who basically just won the battle for Israel by himself, looks around and he's like, wow, God has really delivered the enemies into Israel's hands. Jonathan got that it wasn't about him. Jonathan looks around and sees this is a victory for Israel, not for Jonathan. And I think that that really speaks to his mindset and, and something that we need to emulate as well, that when something goes our way, especially if it's something that it's very clear that God's providence has had some part to play in it, that it's obvious that God has done something for us, that we look at that, that's a great victory for the kingdom. That is a great victory for the church. When a soul is won or something like that, wow, this, this is such a great victory for Christ that has been done through me, not by me, through me. And I think that that's a mindset that will really help us in our walk with Christ. But ultimately, I think sort of the, the message, the overall arching theme of this story is there is no enemy that is too big for God to conquer. You're not going to see an army that God cannot overtake without really a whole lot of effort. Basically, God put out the minimum amount of effort here and just happened to use Jonathan, who was faithful in doing the right thing, as the instrument to have that accomplished. That when we have God on our side, when we're on God's side, we really don't have to worry about what everyone else is doing. We're not all that concerned with how much of the deck is stacked against us, because ultimately we, we know that God is going to be with us and he's going to bless our endeavors if we are doing the things that he wants us to do. That's the kicker. That's the part that sometimes people miss. That just like Jonathan, when we go out into a spiritual battle, that God is always going to have our back and that he is a far greater reinforcement than any army, any force. As much as I love and revere the United States military, if I had to choose between having all the branches of the military, including the Space Force, if I had to choose between having all of them at my back with all the missiles and fighter jets and drones and everything else, or having God on my side, I'd still pick God. Most powerful fighting force in the history of mankind, yeah, God really wouldn't have much of a problem overturning them like that. Not a big deal. Having that kind of awareness and boldness and faith is really what should set us apart from everyone else, shouldn't it? I get that in the world today, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of unknowns, and, and that's understandable to a degree. But ultimately, I do think that we are called to a spirit of courage and not a spirit of fear. And if we're doing the kinds of things that God wants us to do and we realize that God is on our side, 
that's why that anxiety should go away. That's why we should have this sort of peace that passes all understanding. I mean, if there was ever a biblical example of that, I think this story from the life of Jonathan is a pretty good indication of a peace that passes worldly understanding. So we need to look at situations like this as Jonathan saw them, through God's eyes. Stay the course, friends. So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.